Let's look at another problem involving hypothesis tests, but also confidence intervals, putting the two concepts together and looking at how they go together and what the, the small contrast between them. So this is based on a book problem, but I changed some identifying details and numbers. Uh, in the years 2010 to 2012, the home team won 226 of 400 Zombie League football games. Notice that's more than 200. Uh, is this strong evidence of a home field advantage in the ZFL? Uh, one thing I should also note that in 112 of those Zombie League football games, the zombie's foot actually came off with the ball when they kicked the ball. So that's uh, it's one of those things about zombie football. Anyway, um, is there strong evidence for a home field advantage, or is this just random variation? And if so, how big is the home field advantage? That's where we're going to get into the confidence interval part. The yes or no question is something where hypothesis testing is the most appropriate approach. And then if that, oops, if that does prove to show some evidence of a home field advantage, we can quantify that. One way to do that is build a confidence interval for what proportion of games we expect the home uh, team to win. Okay, so let's do the hypothesis testing part. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly here because we've done this is similar to the other video. The null hypothesis it has to be a definite value of p, um, so we can't just say, oh, the null hypothesis is a home field advantage because we couldn't quantify that. So then home field, the lack of home field advantage will be our null hypothesis. That's p equals 0.5, the proportion of games won by the home team. And the alternative hypothesis here, we're specifically asking about a home field advantage. We're asking, is the probability or the proportion won by the home team bigger than 0.5? And so because of the way the question is asked, what we're really interested in, um, we're going to do a one-sided test. Okay, So it's not two-sided it's going to be a one-sided test. And that's going to change the dynamic, the mechanics just a little bit. OK, assumptions and conditions. Well, let's look at the independence assumption. We can't be absolutely sure about this. This is very typical. We're going to assume that the games are pretty much independent of each other. Um, that might not be true. It might be that um, these teams have streaks where they get on a roll and they bit one, win a bunch of games, and that makes them confident and they win more. Or it could be that winning one makes it more likely to lose the next one because of overconfidence. Lots of po possibilities there. Um, the truth is that actually uh, most sporting events, most games, there is a lot of independence, very close to independent, more co closer than most people imagine. Uh, randomization condition, that's a bit dubious as well. It's not a random sample. It's just we took all the games from three years. Um, but it's a nice big sample, and the, the reason that we might be concerned about it would be maybe if 2010 to 2012 were special, if there was some sort of identifiable bias. Maybe there were some rules in effect or some weather conditions or something that made it more likely for home teams to win then that won't be true in the future or weren't true before that. But we're going to have to assume that that's not true, um, and then we'll just advertise that in the conclusion. Assuming that this was, these were representative, um, then here's our conclusion. And then if somebody says, hey, I know a lot about the ZFL, the rules, and they didn't allow partially decomposing zombies that year, so that changes things. Maybe we'll see. Okay. 10% condition. Well, 400, let's say, is, is less than all possible ZFL games. The population here is really all possible, including future ZFL games, because we're actually much more interested in maybe what's going to go on in the future. We're betting on a game. We're interested in who's going to win. Um, so it's, it's less than, let's say, 10% of it's not like there's a finite stock of these games or, or like if you had a certain small population, you're actually grabbing a bunch of them and they could possibly come close to running out. That's not, that's not going to be an issue. Success-failure condition is the most straightforward of all these. We just look at the null value for the proportion. That's 50%. And we do the NP and NQ test on that. Well, we got 400, uh, and that says 200 and 200 for NP0 and NQ0, much bigger than 10. OK, so we're set up. The conditions are satisfied to do a one proportion and one sided z test. So here's our value. We got 226 over 400. 56.5%, 0.565, is the proportion one in those three years. And we want to know, is that strong evidence that there's a home field advantage, or was it just a fluke? OK, so we do the standard deviation of the sampling percentage. Which And it, we're going to assume throughout this, we're going to assume the, the null hypothesis. It's the beauty of hypothesis testing is it allows you to be very definite because you're actually allowed to assume that the null hypothesis is true and then say, given that assumption, how weird is this result? So the null hypothesis, the P0 and the Q0 are just both one half. 
n is 400 happens to be those are both perfect squares. 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.5 squared. If I square root it, I get 0.5. 400 is 20 squared. So in fact, this turns out to be a very nice number. Of course, we can always use the calculator on this if we need to. And 0 0.50 over 20 turns out to be 0.025. Okay. So the standard deviation is 0.25%. So we would kind of say, with this kind of sample, we'd expect 50% um, plus or minus 2.5%. Let's put that in to be won by the home team. And it's really 56.5. Well, that's clearly, okay, that's getting pretty far. We quantify that by making it a z-score. We take this 0.5625, oh, I already did that calculation, 0.565 rather, subtract the uh, put 0.50 from it, divide by the standard deviation, we're 2.6 devi standard deviations high. We're pretty far away from what you would expect, the 50% the, uh, the ratio, and into the region of, of surprising values. Okay, so here the p-value is going to be the probability that I'm out on that right-hand side tail at 2.6 or greater. The probability that I would see this much apparent home field advantage or more if there really no, were no home field advantage, if the null hypothesis were true. Turns out this is, um, the normal CDF is 0.47%. Uh, okay, that's pretty small. That's a small p-value. So less than 1 in 200 times, if you did, if this were a random sample, of course it's not, but if this were a random sample and I sampled 400 things and I got this kind of surprising result, um, only 1 in less than 1 every 200 times would this kind of surprising result happen. Okay, So we reject the null hypothesis at a p uh, level of 0.5, this round, 0.5%, okay? And so that's pretty strong. Anybody who knows statistics says, oh, wow, okay, it's really unlikely that the null hypothesis is true. So there is, indeed, strong evidence that there is a, um, a home field advantage. Okay. So now let's look at a confidence interval. Now that we know that probably there is a home field advantage, let's see what the strength of that signal is by trying to predict what do I think are, are the reasonable values for the percentage of, of games run won by the home team. Now that's going to be centered on this percentage, 56.5%. But what's the spread there? If I want to say, I think usually 56.5% plus or minus some percentage are won by the home team, what's the plus or minus? What's the margin of error? Okay, so it's definitely a very closely related thing. It's a little bit of a different idea because now we're not assuming the null hypothesis, which is good because we've actually we're now actually pretty sure that it's false. Okay, and the calculations are slightly different. One of the nice thing is that you don't have to recheck all the conditions. The qualitative conditions are the same. We've checked those already. The success failure condition is the only thing that really needs to be rechecked, and even that, it's unlikely to be give a different answer. The only thing is that technically we're not running with that old uh, p values, not p naught anymore, because we have now gone away from the idea of the null hypothesis. And so we go with np hat, so that's 400 times the 0.565. Well, of course, that's still much bigger than, that's 226, okay? And um, this is the, this is 1 uh, 74th rest. These are both bigger than 10, okay? So, this is um, only going to be an issue with a small sample size or if the p hat or q hat are very close to 0 or 100%. If it's something that's very lopsided, this can bite you, even though it's a large sample size. Here, it's not a problem. These are way bigger than 10. Now, the mechanics, how does that work? The, the, one of the other subtle differences here is that it's not a standard deviation anymore. We call it a standard error because it really is an estimate we don't really know exactly what the true proportion is. It's almost certainly not 50%, because that was what we discovered with finding and rejecting the null hypothesis. But we don't also believe it's exactly 56.5% either. Um, what we do, uh, what we can do is run with this as an estimate, and that's why we call it a, a standard error. It's not quite as confident as we were before, but that's okay. So that's gonna be 0.565. And then q hat is 1 minus that. That's 0 0.435. And then the n is still the same. Now here we definitely want 
to go ahead and do it on the calculator. Okay, and so that's going to be, um, oops, 20.0248, or if we want to put it in percentage, 2.48%. So notice how close that is. Remember, the, um, the standard deviation was 2.5%. We discovered that the null hypothesis was false, almost certainly, because the hypothesis of the proportion was 50%, but we're not suddenly asserting it's 90% or 10%. We're saying, well, let's run with a very tentative hypothesis, basically, that is 56.5%, the observed proportion. Um, well, then, that, since that 56.5 is very close, this didn't turn out to be very different. So to be careful, we should recalculate this and not just use the standard deviation we had before. If this turns out to be very different in this kind of problem from what you were using before for the standard deviation of p, you probably made a mistake in your calculations. Okay, let me clean that up. Okay, so we, there wasn't a specific confidence level required in the problem. They just said, um, or I just said, how big is the home field advantage? Can we quantify that? We're going to need some margin of error, and so we're going to need to pick a confidence interval. So I figured let's pick 95% because that's a very standard choice. We already know the Z star for that. It's 1.96. So we're going to put that in, and we're going to use the standard error that we got, 2.48%. And then I'll just multiply those together. And that's 4. Point, and let's just round a little bit, 4.9%. We're almost done with the calculation. Let's start rounding. OK. So the margin of error looks like about 4.9%. Um, so our 95% confidence interval here is it's going to be 56.5% plus or minus 4.9%. We're, we can be 95% confident that the true, oh, let me actually put it down here, for the proportion, or let's see, the, yeah, the proportion of games won by the home team is 56.5% plus or minus 4.9%. Now, when you do one of these, if you've rejected the null hypothesis, and here that was 50% for proportion, um, and then you build the confidence interval to sort of elaborate and say how strong of, a, of an effect it is. If the confidence interval then actually includes 50%, then you probably did something wrong again. Because wait, then that's very unlikely that you, I should reject the null hypothesis. Okay, Unless you're using a very different number here from sort of the, the p-value we, we used before. Here the p-value was quite small. It was a 0.5%. Not even close to 2.5 or 5 percent, well, something like that. And so we're pretty sure that the true proportion is way different from 50 percent. That means that when we build this confidence interval, we should definitely not see 50 percent appearing in here. And that's true in this case. 56.5 minus 4.9, that's going to be 50.9 uh, percent all the way, oh no, 51.9, yeah, let's see. 6.5 minus 4.9. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just not doing my math right. 51.6%. There we go. All the way up to 60. Could be as high as 61.4%. As far as we know from this sample, could actually be a 60% chance for the home team to win. This definitely does not include 50%, which is a good double check on our answer. Okay.